And hey folks, me again, back again with another video today. I'm going to go back to the Sega Genesis game, so hope you enjoy. Like, subscribe, follow me on a main on TikTok and Discord, and enough chit chat. Let's begin. Okay. okay. Sega Genesis, one of my Streets favorite of consoles rage. of all time. A console that does what Nintendo, imbued with the legendary power of blast processing. The Genesis, or the Mega Drive, depending on where you're located, had a huge library full of great games, so I decided to take up the difficult task of narrowing it down to my top 15. The games I could play over and over and not get tired of. Some of the most nostalgic of my childhood. If one of your favorites didn't make my list, Sorry, it's my list. Make your own. Here are my top 15 Sega Genesis games. Number 15, Golden Axe 3. You oh, know let's me. see what it you is. You know I love my beat-em-ups, and Golden Axe 3 is a game that many gamers from my generation weren't even aware of. In fact, huh. I didn't play it until I was an adult. Golden Axe wow. 3 was originally only released in North America via the Sega wow. Channel online service. In making this video, I discovered that it's considered by many to be the worst in the series. To my surprise, How? it's actually the one I had the most fun with. It plays it's that, the other why two blame a game that's trying to be good at it for once? Magic powers. But more importantly, there's new characters, including the awesome Thundercats that I always like to play as. Thunder! Thundercats! Ah! My claws and my sharp teeth. My only complaint is that the magic powers aren't as cool looking as the ones found in 1 and 2, but they did introduce branching paths to the series, so replaying the game all over again is a blast. Seeing where all the different routes take you as you battle your way through the land, rescuing your fellow warriors from a dark curse turning them against you. Beware, it's hard as hell, especially near the end, as any great retro game should be. Comic Zone. Growing up in the early 90s, like many kids my age, I was huge into comic books. Sure, we had comic book based games like Maximum Carnage and a plethora of others, but Comic Zone took it to an entirely different level. With dialogue rendered within talking bubbles, colorful mm. environments that pop, and moves that turn you into a muscular superhero ripping through pages, the game literally wow. simulates a moving interactive comic book. To the point where you can even send enemies flying from panel to panel wow. with a kick, and letting you jump between panels. I had never seen a game like this before, and I used to rent it constantly from my local rental store. So much that I probably should have bought it. The creativity and art style alone guarantees a spot in the top 15, but aside from that, the gameplay is awesome, and it has a wild story to match. Comic book artist Sketch Turner is working on his latest comic, and during a storm, a lightning bolt strikes it, sending him into the apocalyptic alien invaded world that he created on the page. While the comic book's villain switches places within the real world and constantly draws in enemies in his path. One of the most original video games of all time. Comic Zone is not one to miss. It's been real good. Robocop versus the Oh Terminator. yes. Crossovers are always fun, but taking two of the biggest action movies at the time. Oh the yes. Your move creep. Robocop versus Terminator, you know that. Yes, we have comic books, but being able to grab a controller and play as Robocop, blowing away Terminators, and trying to save the world in the future, hell yeah. Who needs junk? Oh, I see. It's just an ad, people. It's just an ad. I'll skip it, don't worry. Sure. You're Hell welcome. yeah. Who needs John Connor when you have Detroit's mightiest part man? Park exactly. All cop. A mix of a platformer and a running back. Although you do oh. have to be semi-careful, you can go from full health to being on the brink of death within a second. Although some players see this game as unfairly difficult, which it can be at times, it's an awesome battle. <laughs> <game. laughs> <laughs> 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 
Scott goes to Pinefield Street in Troy to the future of Terminator, where he battled Skynet to its destruction. Try fitting this story in the existing Terminator timeline. Exactly, and this was should have been based on giant Terminator head. How creative. We also fight some bosses straight out of the Robocop movies, including Robo King, Robocop 2, and Ed 209. And you can even snatch a song cannon to use against your foes. But the one downside to this game are the bosses, who are absolute bullet sponges, absorbing an epic amount of fire before going down. But the action-packed gameplay more than makes up for this. It's also available for Super Nintendo with a slightly altered storyline, but the Sega version is superior in every way. Instead of the SNES's toned down violence, the Sega version has Robocop's enemies exploding into a bloody mess. Violent and gritty, just like the movies it's based from. Exactly. Yes, please. Number 12, Black Shot. Disney used to make a ton of games in the early days of gaming, many being platformers, and some of them provided a massive amount of fun. From the NES to the SNES to the Genesis, Disney was a video game making machine. Quackshot starring Donald Duck is one of the most nostalgic to me, being one of the earliest Sega Genesis games I ever played. Even though it's one of the easiest games found on the console, it's a satisfying little adventure, a lot like the DuckTales cartoon and an entertaining ripoff of Indiana Jones. When Donald is flipping through books in Scrooge McDuck's library, he finds a map sending him on an adventure around the world with Huey, Dewey, and Louie to find the lost treasure of King Garusia, ruler of the ancient Duck Kingdom. The game lets you choose which locations around the world to travel to, and you unlock more as you progress through the story requiring a little bit of backtracking to reach new areas as Big Bad Pete follows Donald in an attempt to steal the treasure. But Donald is not to be trifled with. Carrying such deadly weapons as a gun that shoots plungers, popcorn, bubbles, and deadliest of all, chili peppers that send him on a frenzy running through his foes with intense range. Wow. With really that gameplay and fun level design, including an ancient temple in Mexico, a haunted Viking ship, and a Castlevania-inspired level, complete with a boss Sick. battle against Count Duckula, makes <laughs> Quackshot a game that should be a part of every Sega Genesis collection. Yep. A Disney game referencing Castlevania. That's amazing. Number 11, Gunstar Heroes. A very Contra inspired game, the first video game released by developer Treasure, which was founded by ex Konami employees. The Gunstars are a mercenary family on a quest to stop an evil empire from reviving an ancient weapon, using the power of four magical gems hidden throughout the planet. And it's up to the Gunstars to run and gun their way through multiple levels in a fast paced and very colorful shooter. Taking the gameplay of Contra and adding a cartoony look really makes Gunstar Heroes stand out among the shooters of the time and is considered by some to be one of the greatest games of all time. And I would have to agree. Once I started playing this game, it was hard to put it down, and I almost gave it a second playthrough while recording this footage because it was so much fun. The difficulty is perfectly balanced, ending up in an experience that's not very hard, but at the same time, not overly easy either, packed with awesome boss battles and even a villain that looks strangely similar to M. Bison from Street Fighter. Thanks. One aspect that makes it unique compared to Contra is the ability to mix and match your weapons, able to fuse multiple combinations together, creating an ultimate weapon of destruction. The final portion of the game is easily one of the most entertaining of any, as the bosses of the game unite, watching the action unfold via a huge monitor. One by one, the bosses take turns trying to take you out as their leader panics over your success until you've defeated them all. Gunstar Heroes is a perfect example of what a new developer filled with talented creators can come up with, especially with the limited technology at the time. Knight Adventures. 
another game designed by the same people that worked on Contra during Konami's glory days. This time resulting in a very different game starring a possum knight wearing a jetpack, fighting an army of robots and pigs. Sparks through the rocket knight is armed with a sword and can rocket across the screen at high speed. I've always enjoyed these bright, colorful, cartoony games. They're always so much fun to play, and Rocket Knight Adventures is no different. Most of the game is spent on 2D platforming sections, throwing your sword at pigs and their mechanical devices. And the game keeps itself fresh by mixing in different gameplay elements. One moment, you might be blasting through the land at high speeds. Then you might find yourself on a minecart, avoiding enemy attacks, jumping from cart to cart, or even fighting an evil Rocket Knight possum, trying to hold on to dear life as the vacuum of space threatens to suck you away. Rocket Knight Adventures is a game full of imagination each boss battle feels completely different from the last. When it comes to retro games, I think it's essential to have boss battles that stand out from other games. And this one had me constantly excited to see what was coming up next. X-Men 2 Clone Wars. Yes, the Clone Wars. Not the same event from the Star Wars universe. Comic book exactly. games have always been hit or miss to me. They were either fantastic to play like Maximum Carnage or digital electronic turds like Uncanny X-Men on the NES. X-Men 2 Clone Wars is one of the greatest and has one of the most confusing intro sequences ever made. The game just starts randomly assigning you a character, doesn't give you a story, nothing. It just drops you into a level full of tanks and ninjas that you have to battle your way through. After this, you're given a title screen and introduced to the game's outstanding soundtrack. Just listen to this theme. so good. And then Professor X sends his X-Men on a mission to defeat the techno-organic alien race known as the Phalanx and keep them from assimilating the Earth. Battling through several environments familiar to any X-Men fan. Magneto's home base of Avalon, the Savage Land, the Sentinel Factory, and more. And this is another game filled with exhilarating boss battles. The Sentinel Factory in particular is awesome. After defeating Master Mold, the factory begins a self-destruct sequence and you have to race your way out before it explodes. It's exciting as hell and shows off how awesome the rest of the game is. Like any good X-Men game, you have an assortment of characters to choose from. Beast, who's always my least favorite play since he practically has no real powers. Psylocke with her psychic knife that zaps enemies into oblivion. Gambit with his exploding cards. Nightcrawler who can teleport, which is actually kind of useless power here. Wolverine with his claws, and Cyclops with his laser blast. But if that selection of X-Men isn't good enough for you, once you defeat Magneto, he joins the team and you can even play as the Master of Magnetism. It's so awesome. Filled with recognizable bosses from the overall X-Men universe, including Apocalypse, my favorite. X-Men 2 Clone Wars absolutely blows away the first X-Men game on the console. <laughs> Adventures of Batman and Robin, also available on the Super Nintendo, yet a completely different game. The Sega Genesis version is the better one by far, and one of the best comic book based games of the time, more specifically based on the animated series. It's a typical Batman story, the crazed inmates of Arkham Asylum are on the loop. Just that people. Played. Instead of a more detective style or beat em up game, it's almost like a run and gun shooter. And Batman and Robin, depending on who you choose, both if you choose to play two players, chuck an endless amount of batteries. How do their arms not get tired? And where is he hiding all these batteries? Video game logic, I suppose. Batman and Robin is insanely difficult, requiring precision and quick reaction time, as most levels are comprised of a huge stream of enemies rushing back. Each level starts off just like the cartoon show, too, having an intro slide. Such a cool touch, making each level feel like an episode of the series. 
This game had to be on this list. Aside from the exhilarating gameplay, the variety of level design and the boss battles are amazing. From the streets of Gotham where Joker is trying to kill Batman with an enormous air balloon packed with crazy weapons, to the skies of Gotham flying the Batwing and taking on a huge warship, to a construction site coming apart as machine gun turrets fire at you and Two-Face throws dynamite, to an insane recreation of Wonderland, and a trippy seizure-inducing sequence that has you dodging obstacles while trying to take out Mad Hatter floating above. Need I say more? I can't praise this game enough. So it's a pretty good game. Highly recommended. Number seven, Shinobi Three: Return of the Ninja Master. One of oh. the most popular franchises, Shinobi has you playing as a badass ninja. The ninjas are cool. On this list, it was really go ninja, go ninja, go, go, go. But I thought Three go. was slightly better since I enjoyed the levels a little bit more. When the evil Neo Z is threatening the world once more, it's up to Joe Musashi to grab his ninja weapon and defeat the Shadow Master. Some of these stages feel downright cinematic, especially the ones where you're riding a horse and the enemies are running after you in the background. It looks like something right out of a Japanese samurai movie. Musashi is armed with well, little looks little so daggers, which are incredibly fun to chuck at enemies. He has several magic powers that help him on his quest. My favorite being the lightning, since it casts a shield around you and absorbs several hits. Something essential when it comes to later bosses. As a fan of variety in video games, I love the environment, starting out in nature through caves and the Japanese Indian countryside, but soon enough, you're surfing like a real ninja badass and traveling through a burning forest. Just look at those background graphics. While recording this footage, I actually had to stop and just stare at it for a while. For a 16-bit console, just wow. And the further you progress in Shinobi 3, the more insane it gets as you fight Mechagodzilla. Yes, Mechagodzilla wow. in this game. Wow, now that right there is metal. And eventually you end up in a crazy virtual environment fighting some kind of robo-ninja, followed by a very Castlevania-style ending. If you want to pick one Sega Genesis ninja game, this is the one to go with. That right there is epic. That right there is metal. <laughs> Number six, Splatterhouse 3. One of the first Sega Genesis games I ever owned, and the first Splatterhouse title I was ever exposed to. Splatterhouse 3 used to scare the hell out of me. If you're looking at it by today's standards, it may not seem scary, but picture a child in the early 90s sitting in a dark room playing a game full of monsters and gore as a character that looks like Jason Voorhees filled with realistic looking cutscenes. The game was simply haunting. It plays like a beat-em-up sending the main character Rick to a mansion floor by floor, room by room, taking on enemies and killing them in brutal manners. When you collect enough blue orbs, you can use the power of the mask and unleash your physical strength on the creatures. So he goes full on Bane. And see if Dracula can defend himself. And the replayability is great. Usually I don't like being timed in games. That's actually one of my top gaming peeves. But having a timer in Splatterhouse 3 makes you try and get better and better. Since taking too long actually affects the story. Changing story points like deciding if you get to save your wife or if she gets killed by a brain-eating worm that turns people into monsters. And the monster designs are awesome. The sound effects of some of their deaths traumatize you. confidently credit Splatterhouse 3 as being one of the biggest contributors to my early dabbling in horror movies. Thank you, Splatterhouse 3. Turtles, the Hyperstone Heights. This is a game that many people haven't heard of whenever I bring it up, and understandably so. During that time period, the big popular Turtles game was Turtles in Time, and it completely overshadowed all of them. 
probably because it was in arcades everywhere and it had a fantastic SNES port. But rest assured, Hyperstone Heights is an original game for the Genesis, heavily inspired by Turtles Time Shirt, sharing the same exact gameplay and enemies, but plenty of new stuff as well. Like an entirely original level set in the Foot Clan headquarters in Japan, where you fight Tatsu from the movies. This game was almost as good as Turtles in Time, but one thing that I felt kept it from being as good was some recycled bosses. For example, you fight Leatherhead, and then later you fight another Leatherhead, just a different colored one. And this isn't the only boss they do this with. I, I would have liked it better if it had been a different boss altogether from the Gallery of Ninja Turtles ones, instead of just a recoloring of the boss you've already faced. And this time around, instead of sending the turtle back in time, Shredder gets his hand on the mysterious Hyperstone and uses it to shrink Manhattan in the Statue of Liberty and it's up to the Turtles to stop them. Easily the best Ninja Turtles game on the Genesis, and it belongs in your collection right next to Turtles in Time. <laughs> futuristic and gritty shoot em up. As is normal with Contra, you die in one hit and have to watch everything around you as a hellstorm of bullets, robots, and aliens are constantly coming at you, rocking another awesome soundtrack. This is Contra at its finest, providing a huge collection of intense boss fights that require fast thinking and multiple paths in the story, with multiple endings depending on what choices you make during the campaign. For example, after defeating the first boss, you have the option to hunt him down, or you can let him go, both options sending you to completely different levels. Contra Hardcore adds in several aspects that set it apart from other Contra games. Instead of two characters, you have the option of four. A man, a woman, a wolf with a chain gun arm, or a little robot called Brownie. It's the craziest cast of Contra characters yet. My favorite being Brownie, since he's so small that a lot of enemy projectiles go right over his head. And each character has their own arsenal of weapons exclusive to them, encouraging you to play through the game multiple times to unlock the different ending and trying out all the different weapons. And of course, like typical Contra, you start off fighting robotic bosses, but end up in some crazy alien-infested levels filled with grotesque creatures. It's hard to say because there's so many good Contra games, but this one may be my favorite in the entire series. If not, it's very close to the top. And if you decide to play this game, make sure you look up the secret Castlevania cameo. Good game, actually. Holy shit. Oh no. Look out. I knew that was gonna hit me. Speaking of Castlevania, number three, Castlevania Bloodlines. If you've been on this channel for even a short amount of time, you know I love Castlevania. And even though I think there's plenty of so Castlevania better than Bloodlines, this is not a game to miss at all. The only Castlevania found on the Genesis, Bloodlines feels like a more mature game, with hanging bodies in the background, ripped in half and dripping blood, and the difficulty to match. Rest assured, this is not an easy game by any means. Every level beaten is a breath of fresh air, with awesome looking bosses that get better and better as the game goes on. And you look just an ad, people, just an ad. Better and better as the game goes on, ending with a Dracula battle where Dracula turns into a huge demonic form after you face one of the most difficult incarnations of death in the series. Story-wise, it's the first Castlevania game where you play as a non-Belmont, introducing the Morris clan, cousins of the Belmonts currently entrusted with the vampire killer. I always thought it was interesting playing as a character apart from the Belmonts, and made the game feel different from the rest of them and you even get the option to play as a secondary character that has a spear for a weapon. And instead of, say, traveling through the forest to end up in Dracula's castle, you travel through different cities in the world, infested with monsters, and World War I rages on. It's definitely a unique game in the Castlevania series, and has that special Sega Genesis feel that you can't quite describe. You have to feel it. Sporting excellent controls and a soundtrack that's welcome among the great Castlevania music that came before and after. Quit dying! <laughs> Number 
two, Streets of Rage. Now, this might not be the most popular opinion, but Streets of Rage 1 is my favorite out of the entire series. Hmm. It seems see. the majority of players tend to choose 2 as the best in the series, but I disagree. I felt that 2 was way too easy in comparison to the first game, and the music was nowhere near as good. It's no secret that I enjoy difficult games, and the brutal difficulty of the first game makes me prefer it, forcing you to perfect your moves to face the relentless enemies of the end game, such as the annoying clone limit bounce around like crazy, and Mr. X's onslaught of bullets as he thugs us all. Beat-em-ups are among my favorite type of games to play, and having a Genesis exclusive series inspired by the likes of Final Fight is a huge plus for the console. Sorry Streets of Rage has a similar style and storyline as Final Fight. A city filled with crime and heroes rise up to enforce justice with their fists. This time, ex-cops, which means you also get awesome super moves where police backup arrives and blast the hell out of the gang members surrounding you. It's such a badass special move, and sadly, Streets of Rage 2 and 3 got rid of that. The game is My definitely goodness. a product of its time, and the music sent me right back to the early 90s Sega era with the kind of beats you could not find anywhere else. Yes, I love this game, and yes, I think it's better than 2 and 3. The Hedgehog 2. I don't even know if I can pinpoint exactly what it is that makes Sonic 2 so special. It's the one game that pops up in my head instantly when I think Sega Genesis. Oh, I love that game. Sonic the Hedgehog. So I love that game. Like, amped it up. Introducing Tails for the first time and expanding the world of Sonic. The level design of the first game was great. In 2, it was outstanding. Leading to some of the most memorable stages in Sonic the Hedgehog history. The Chemical Plant Zone being my favorite one. The futuristic city in the background and neon purple water. The colorful pinball level with all kinds of flashing lights and effects. Flying on Tails' plane as you chase down Robotnik's ship. And then hang on as you get blasted into space to fight an evil robot Sonic. Sonic 2 is full of such epic moments. And the bonus stages are now these fun but crazy difficult running stages. Especially as you get further and further into them. Which is incredibly rewarding once you beat them all. Each one awards you with a Chaos Emerald if you win. But this time around, collecting all seven Chaos Emeralds allows you to change to Super Sonic for the first time. An invincible weapon of speed and destruction. Something new to the series that has stayed ever since. As usual, Dr. Robotnik is the boss at the end of each stage, and he has an entirely new set of vehicles and inventions ready to kill Sonic. Like a claw machine in a huge pinball world, a submarine hiding in an oil field that shoots lasers, and his final weapon is a giant mech suit you have to battle with zero ring. He is not messing around this time, no longer simply running away at the end of the game as you chase him. And the soundtrack. It's hard to choose what the best stage music is because it all sounds so great. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is an absolute classic across all game consoles and is my favorite game on the Sega Genesis. Topping off my top 15. And leave me some comments down below sharing your favorite games that weren't on my... Anyway, folks, hope you do enjoy the video. Like, subscribe, follow me on Amino, TikTok, and Discord, and God bless y'all for it. And yes, I do highly recommend these games. And I'll see y'all next video.